Now, if you're looking for ways to skip the trips to the post office and dodge all that hectic holiday shopping traffic, why not save time and money with Stamps.com? Stamps.com lets you compare rates, print labels, and access exclusive discounts on UPS and USPS services all year long. It just makes sense, especially if your business sends more mail and packages during the holidays. I know I've talked to you guys about this before, but I recently just moved and I am constantly sending out packages and receiving receiving packages and having to return things. So I am constantly having to deal with shipping and printing labels and all of that. And stamps.com makes the process so seamless and so much less stressful. So whether you're selling online or running an office or side hustle, stamps.com can save you so much time, money, and stress during the holidays. Going to the post office instead of using stamps.com is kind of like taking the stairs instead of the elevator. And I don't know about you guys, but I always like to use the elevator. If you spend more than a few minutes a week dealing with mailing and shipping, stamps.com is a lifesaver. You will save so much time and money. Save time and money this holiday season with stamps.com. Sign up with promo code KILLER for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, free postage, and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter the code KILLER. Again, that is just stamps.com, promo code KILLER. Hello everyone, what is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct, you guys. If you are new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I am your host of Killer Instinct. Before we get started, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button, that way you never miss an episode. We post weekly here on the podcast every Wednesday and then every Thursday on YouTube. Now, as you guys can tell by the title of today's case, today we are discussing the solved double homicide of Patricia Whitaker and her son, Kevin Whitaker. I know we say this all the time, but this case is very crazy and twisted. So I don't want to give too much away today. So with that being said, let's jump right on into it. So let's start this case out by talking about who the Whitaker family is. So you had Patricia and Kent Whitaker who were married, as well as their two sons, Kevin Whitaker and Thomas Whitaker. And Thomas went by the name Bart. Now looking at family photos, the Whitakers looked like your average everyday family. Kent and Patricia met on a blind date and they headed off right when they first met. Kent was an accountant and Patricia was an elementary school teacher and the family lived in Sugarland, Texas. Now, Sugarland is a very white collar neighborhood. It's middle to upper class and Patricia and Kent felt like it was the perfect place for them to raise a family. The two got married and had their two sons, Bart and Kevin, and Bart and Kevin were absolutely a adored by their parents. Patricia loved being a mother. Her kids were all she would talk about, and her friends said that her kids were her biggest pride and joy. Bart is described as someone who excelled in school. He was also very quick-witted and respectful. He loves biking, and something that him and Kent would do often is biking together. It was their bonding experience that the two of them shared. They would go and bike different trails together and just talk about life and really were able to connect connect in that way. Now, Bart definitely went through a rebellious phase in high school. He ended up getting asked to leave his high school. It was Clements High School that he was asked to leave after he was robbing other students at the school and stealing their belongings. Bart was then seen by a psychiatrist who said that he experienced clinical symptoms of someone with delusional paranoid disorder. Now, while Bart gets coined as the witty son, Kevin was definitely the more sensitive one of the two of them. His father, Kent said that he was extremely mature for his age. Even though he was the youngest in the family, he did sometimes act like the most responsible. Kevin was always very forgiving and he was always looking out for others. And friends of this family in general have always said that they were a very bubbly, lighthearted, fun family to be around. They seemed like your white picket fence family in this really safe neighborhood. Bart and Kevin had these incredibly loving parents. Everything was really looking good for them. But everything changed on December 10th, 
2003. Now, this day was actually supposed to be a really happy and celebratory day for the Whitaker family. Bart had called his parents and told them that he had officially graduated from Sam Houston State University. He said that he finished his final exams and had completed all of his credits, and so he would be graduating. Now, the family decided to celebrate this accomplishment by going to dinner the night of December 10th. They went to a restaurant called Papadell, which was nearby. Kent and Patricia even went out and bought him a $4,000 Rolex watch. Patricia was so proud of Bart. Ken said that when she got the phone call from Bart, she was jumping up and down. She was absolutely ecstatic that her son had accomplished this, and the whole family was just really excited to celebrate that. Now, according to Kent, the dinner was amazing. Everyone was having a great time. Everyone was laughing and enjoying a great meal together, and there actually is a picture. It's a very eerie picture of Kevin, Patricia, and Bart on the night of this dinner, and to just think that several hours later, this family was going to be ripped apart is very eerie to think about when looking at it. Now, after dinner, the four of them drove back home to Kent and Patricia's house. They got there around 8.20 p.m. on December 10th, and that is when everything went south. Now, Kent, Kevin, and Patricia walked into the house first. It was actually Kevin who opened the door, and then Patricia behind him, and then Kent behind her. Bart did start walking into the house with his family. However, he remembered that he left his phone in his car. So he told them to just keep going while he turned around and went to go grab his phone. Once Bart turned around and started walking for the car, that is when he heard three shots being fired from inside of his house. Bart then ran up to the house and the scene that he walked into was horrifying. Kevin was the first one to walk into the house since he opened the door and once he walked into the house, he was shot in the chest as he was walking into the dining room. The bullet went right through his heart and he died instantly. Patricia was shot next. She was also shot in the chest the second she walked through the door. And at this point, Kent was standing on the front porch of the house. So he was standing outside. However, he was close enough to the door that the intruder was able to shoot him from standing inside and the bullet did hit his shoulder. Now, while all this was going on, Bart then ran into the house and tried to attack the intruder himself. However, he ended up getting shot in the arm as well. The intruder then escaped through the back door of the house and was gone. Now, despite his injuries, Kent was able to pick up the phone and call 911, and first responders arrived onto the scene and took all of them to the hospital. However, Patricia succumbed to her injuries after being airlifted to the hospital, and Kevin sadly passed away within moments of being shot. So while Patricia and Kevin did not survive this attack, Kent and Bart did. When authorities arrived on the scene, they found a 9mm handgun on the kitchen floor next to the back door where the intruder escaped from. Authorities were able to speak to both Kent and Bart, who told them that the intruder was wearing black clothing and a ski mask. However, Kent did say that he was able to tell that the intruder was white because he could see the white skin around his eyes. Now, the first detective on the scene was a man named Detective Marshall Slot. Now, once he arrived, he noticed a black leather glove lying on the curb next to Bart's car that the family had drove back home in from the restaurant. Now, when more detectives arrived onto the scene and they started doing a walkthrough of the home, they noticed that this looked like a robbery. Everything was set up to look like a robbery. It looked like the house had been ransacked. It looked like someone was trying to go through it very quickly. However, even though it looked like a robbery, there was nothing of value that was taken from the home. The family still had several computers. They had all of their TVs and their audio and video equipment were still there. Along with that, there were also other valuables like Patricia's jewelry that was just in plain sight. All of the dresser drawers in the master bedroom had also looked like they were opened one or two inches, but only for visual purposes to make it seem like someone was trying to go through them. Now to detectives, what this meant is that even though this was staged to look like a robbery, the real targets of this attack were the Whitaker family. And along with that, something else that authorities noticed that they believed to be strange was the fact that in Kevin's room, which was located on the second floor of the house, he had a gun safe. However, this gun safe was in a very particular place. This gun safe was in a crawl space in his room. It was one of those places where you would never know that it was there 
unless you knew that it was there, unless someone told you or showed you, you wouldn't know that that would be there. So that indicated to authorities that someone had to have known that that gun was up there because it's not hiding in plain sight. You have to go through a crawl space to get it. And the gun that was in Kevin's safe ultimately ended up being the murder weapon. Now, the next thing authorities did is they brought in scent dogs. So they brought in three scent dogs and started them in the back of the house. And they did that because that is where the intruder escaped from. So they wanted the dogs to pick up on a scent and eventually lead authorities to where this scent went after that. But weirdly enough, once the dogs picked up on the scent, they traced the scent all the way back to Bart's car. Again, Bart was driving a Yukon car at the time and it was parked in the front of the Whitaker house. And this was also the car that the family had all came back in. Now, along with that, the day after the attack, authorities were able to get more information from Kent and Bart. They started hearing about what the story was, what happened that night, and how they went to dinner to celebrate Bart's graduation. Police decided to follow up on the information that Bart had graduated from college by calling Sam Houston University and asking them for Bart's transcripts. And this is when they were informed that not only did Bart never graduate from Sam Houston, Bart wasn't even enrolled as a student at all at Sam Houston. Now, when the police confronted Bart with this information, what he said was absolutely bizarre. Bart told authorities that he told his mom that he didn't graduate and that he was never a student there. And if that makes no sense to you, it's because it makes no sense. The whole basis of this celebration, the whole reason for this dinner was the fact that Bart graduated college. So it's very bizarre for him to now say that, oh no, everyone knew that I didn't graduate. Now, five days after the murders, a man named Adam Hip walked in to the Sugarland Police Department and asked to speak with the detective Marshall Slot. The two sat down and Detective Slot was was not prepared for what he was about to hear. Adam told Detective Slot that he used to be friends with Bart. The two of them went to the same high school, but in 2001, Bart reached out to Adam and essentially tried to recruit Adam in the killing of his family. Now, according to Adam, he said that the reason that Bart wanted to do this and the motive behind it was because Bart had told him that if he was able to kill his family, he would be able to inherit a million dollars in the estate that his family owned. So that was his motive behind doing all of this. And when Adam was explaining the plan that Bart had set out for him and the blueprint that Adam was supposed to follow, this was pretty much exactly what had happened five days prior on December 10th, 2003. Adam had said that Bart had told him that him and his family would be going out to dinner, and when they got home, that is when the attack would take place. Adam was able to write out police a blueprint of the Whitaker home based off of what Bart had told him in the past. Adam was even able to tell police that part of Bart's plan was being shot in the arm so he would be able to avoid suspicion. All right, you guys, I wanna to talk to you about BetterHelp. And if you've never heard of BetterHelp before, BetterHelp is an online counseling system that provides you with professional counseling in the comfort of your own home. Once you sign up with BetterHelp, you will then be giving a survey. And based off of the answers on that survey, you will then be matched with a counselor that is best deemed to fit your needs. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses from your counselor. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. BetterHelp has counselors that specialize in multiple different areas, such as depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, sleeping, trauma, anger, family conflicts, LGBTQ plus matters, and more. Anything you share with your BetterHelp counselor is going to be confidential. And if at any time you want to change your BetterHelp counselor, you will be able to do so at free of charge. BetterHelp is convenient, professional, and affordable. And right now, I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash instinct. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that is betterhelp.com slash instinct. 
All right, I don't know about you guys, but have you ever just been too damn high? We have all been there, and with today's weed, sometimes it's a dangerous game. That's why I love Dadgrass. Dadgrass is reviving the pleasure of the casual smoke so you can chill out without the stress. Dadgrass is legal, organic, smokable hemp that relaxes your body and mellows your mind. Their 100% organic pre rolled joints are very low in THC and high in CBD, so you can enjoy the effects of CBD while keeping a clear head. You can chill out without getting stoned. It's like having a glass of wine, not the whole bottle. That's how I like to explain it to everyone. And all Dadgrass products are federally legal for ages 21 and over, and it ships right to your door anywhere in the US. I've definitely talked to you guys about this before, how I have had very bad symptoms and effects of just smoking straight THC. I can't do it. However, it is nice after a long day to be able to relax a little bit and not is why I love dad grass. I love their pre-rolled joints. I keep one with me pretty much at all times because you never know when you're going to need it. And so I highly, highly recommend. Right now, dad grass is offering our listeners 20% off your first order when you go to dadgrass.com slash killer. Go to dadgrass.com slash killer for 20% off your first order. That's dadgrass.com slash killer. I know I keep telling you guys about the fact that I recently moved. However, I want to talk to you guys about one of my favorite new essentials in my apartment, and that is my Helix mattress. I have had it for a couple months now, and I am obsessed with it. It is so comfortable. I absolutely love it, and I really can't believe how well I have been sleeping. I personally ordered the Birch Lux mattress, and I have a bad back. Fun fact about me, I broke it about five years ago, so finding a mattress mattress that is comfortable yet secure is really important for me. Finding a mattress that doesn't make me wake up in extreme back pain is very important for me. And I was so happy that that was not the case with Birch. I'm sleeping better. I fall asleep right away and I'm a lot more rested when I wake up. Birch makes organic non-toxic mattresses made right here in America and shipped straight to your door with no contact delivery, free shipping, free returns, and a 100-night sleep trial. Birch mattresses are made here in America with just three materials sourced straight from nature, organic latex, New Zealand wool, and American steel springs. So if you are in the market for a new mattress, check out birchliving.com slash killer and check it out today. Birch is giving $200 off all mattresses and two free e rest pillows at birchliving.com slash killer. That's $200 off all mattress orders and two free eco rest pillows. Now I know it's getting darker and the weather is getting colder, but I do not mind one bit. I love staying in and watching Sundance Now. There are so many amazing shows that I cannot get enough of. Sundance Now is an ad-free streaming service created by AMC Networks for people who appreciate riveting storytelling and fresh perspectives. If meaningful shows are your escape, then Sundance Now is definitely for you. Sundance Now offers the best of true crime series, dramas, and thrillers all over the world. Their original series, Dead Places, One Lane Bridge, and The Trail in the Outback, the Lindy Chamberlain story, are sure to excite and entertain. One of my favorites from Sundance Now is called Too Close, and it actually just came out on November 4th. It's a three-part drama based on the novel of the same title under the pseudonym Natalie Daniels. The miniseries is the powerful story of how two women became dangerously close when fate forced them together. Dedicated forensic psychiatrist Dr. Emma Robinson is not easily shocked. She's worked with her fair share of security patients, and then she is sent to assess Connie, who is facing trial for a terrible crime. Can Emma find out what happened on the night of the crime, or what happened to turn Connie into a monster? How does her beautiful friend Ness fit into it, and why does Connie's husband refuse to see her? As Emma tries to make sense of all of it, Connie starts to show a searing insight into Emma's deepest insecurities and begins to brutally exploit them. Their sessions become a complex psychological game with confusing and emotional undercurrents. As Emma tries to uncover the truth and learn what triggered Connie's despicable behavior, it seems that her attempts to see justice may have just destroyed her instead. You can stream Sundance now on all your favorite devices for as low as $4.99 a month. Just download the app or watch online and discover exclusive shows from around the world instantly. Start streaming your next obsession. Try Sundance now for free for 30 days by going to sundancenow.com and use the promo code KILLER. That's sundancenow.com, code 
killer for 30 days of free streaming. SundanceNow.com code killer. When it comes to true crime podcasts, Generation Y is the pioneer. If you're obsessed with the crime series and unsolved murder cases, this show has it all. Hosts Aaron and Justin cover cases from all angles. They break down theories, dive deep into forensic evidence, and discuss their opinions on the most perplexing cases. In one recent episode, you'll hear the unusual case of Michelle Nyrider. In 2017, in Coring, New York, Sergeant John McDivitt conducted a welfare check at Nyrider's house. Through the glass of the front door, he was able to see a silhouette of a woman and knew something terrible had happened. Inside the home, he found Nyrider dead. At first glance, it was easy to assume she had taken her own life. But when it became clear that this wasn't an open and shut case, the first person suspected was Nyrider's ex-husband. And even though he had an alibi, some questions remained, and this whodunit case takes some highly unexpected turns. Now, clearly everyone here loves a true crime podcast, and I'm telling you guys, this one is one of my favorites. I love how in-depth and so detailed the hosts of the Generation Y podcast are. They pick crazy cases every week, and it is really one of the biggest highlights of my week. So listen to the Generation Y podcast on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can listen ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Now, because Adam was able to go into such great detail and basically map out everything from front to back, authorities thought it was very possible that maybe he himself was involved in this and that he was just coming forward and confessing, essentially. However, after doing some digging in on his alibi and figuring out where he was on December 10th, Adam Hip was working on December 10th, and so he was eliminated as a suspect. Now, when Adam was talking to authorities about Bart's plan, he also said that Adam wasn't the only person that Bart had enlisted help from. Adam said that Bart also reached out to his college roommate at the time. This was a man named Justin Peters who lived in San Antonio, Texas, and when speaking to authorities, Justin told police that their original plan was to carry out this execution on April 5th, 2000. 2001. Mind you, this family didn't actually get attacked until December 10th, 2003. Justin said that Bart was basically the ringleader of this entire operation, and April 5th, 2001 wasn't the only time that Bart had tried to carry this out. There was also one time prior to that as well in December of the year 2000. So you have an attempt in December of 2000, April 2001, and then an actual attack in December 2003. I think it's crazy to think of the fact that Bart was planning on doing this for years. He was attending family gatherings. He was talking to his family on the phone. He was going on vacations with them. And all while that was happening, he was planning on annihilating them. Now, the Whitaker family actually got a warning of what Bart was doing, and that is because while Bart was discussing with Justin and Adam one day about their plan, a colleague of Bart's ended up overhearing this, and she ended up reaching out to authorities. The authorities then reached out to Bart's parents. So Kent and Patricia were then told that Bart was planning on killing their entire family. However, Kent said that at that time, he didn't believe it, he didn't want to believe it, which is on understandable why you wouldn't want to believe something like that. And Bart was very convincing. He said that the entire thing was one big misunderstanding and the family just kind of moved on from there. So now it was time for detectives to hone in on Bart a little more. So they looked into his life. At the time of the killings, authorities learned that Bart did have a roommate. The two of them lived in a townhouse together and this roommate's name was Chris Brasher. Now, along with that, someone else in Bart's close social circle was one of his co-workers. Bart and his co-worker worked at a country club as a bartender, and this co-worker's name is Stephen Champagne. Detectives spoke with both Chris and Stephen, who actually both agreed to give DNA samples. They were also put in a scent lineup, which is essentially exactly how it sounds. Police have search dogs try and track a scent from a lineup, and the dogs all went 
to Chris. Now, this indicated that Chris had come in contact with either the leather glove that was found outside, the murder weapon, the doors in the master bedroom, or the gun safe in Kevin's room. Now, this is when authorities had a new idea. They decided that they needed to make sure that Adam's story of being recruited by Bart two years prior was accurate. So, they got together with Adam and decided to do a fake phone call, essentially. And on this phone call, Adam was going to tell Bart that authorities were starting to ask him a couple questions about the 2001 incident and basically just see how Bart was going to react. So police and Adam got together and Adam made this phone call. And just like I said, Adam started telling him that police were getting suspicious, asking him some questions. And this is when Bart offered Adam $20,000 dollars if he would lie to police and tell them that he basically has no idea what he what the police are talking about and that it's one big misunderstanding and that it's not true Now, all the evidence that was piling up against Bart at this point was purely circumstantial. There was no real evidence that proved that any of this was happening, so authorities couldn't arrest Bart at this point. They couldn't do anything about it, and a couple months later, in June 2004, Bart's Yukon car was found abandoned with the engine running in an apartment complex parking lot, and he was nowhere to be found. Authorities did a search around the area, however, couldn't find him, And that is when they realized that Bart was on the run. So then fast forward to August 2005. So we are well over a year of Bart being missing. And this is when Stephen Champagne, which remember was Bart's co-worker, reached out to authorities and said that he wanted to speak with them. Stephen met Detective Slaw at a Starbucks and this is where he spilt everything. Stephen told the detective that Stephen was the one driving the getaway car on December 10th, 2003, and that Chris Brasher was the one who shot the entire family. So Chris was the intruder, Stephen was driving the getaway car. However, all of this was orchestrated by Bart. He said all of this was Bart's idea and even took authorities to the spot where Chris and Steven disposed of all of the belongings that could possibly incriminate them, all of the pieces of evidence. And then after that, he said the two of them went to a bar and paid for the bar tab using the money that they had stole from the Winnegar home. So now police basically have a confession from Steven. However, still again, Bart is nowhere to be found. Now, after speaking to authorities, Steven was arrested and Chris was also arrested shortly after. However, still Bart was nowhere to be found. No one had any idea where he was. One month after Steven and Chris's arrest, authorities received another phone call. And this phone call was from a man who named himself as Mike Jones. And Mike Jones was very much an alias. However, that is what he said his name was. And according to him, he said that he knew that Bart was in Mexico. Now, he said the reason that he knew that Bart was in Mexico was because Bart had paid this specific man $3,000 to drive him there. Police were able to track Bart down in Monterey, Mexico, and were finally able to arrest him on September 22nd, 2005. They learned that he had gone down there with $7,000 in cash that he had stolen from his father and was living in a small apartment and had a job at a local furniture store at the time of his arrest. Now, authorities also learned that Bart was keeping himself busy while he was in Mexico. He started dating a new woman. Her name is Cindy Lou Salinas. And when authorities got in contact with her and started talking to her about their relationship, she had a lot to say about Bart. Cindy said that Bart had told him that he was an only child. His entire life, he was an only child. And not only that, he said that his parents never loved him. He said that him and his mother had a very estranged relationship, and that was why they never spoke. He also claimed to Cindy that his mother was a sex worker and that his family ignored him his entire life, leaving him with bucket loads of trauma. Now, obviously, no one knows what goes on behind closed doors. However, every single person has said that this family was so incredibly loving, that these boys were so incredibly adored, 
And so the story of Bart not being loved by his parents does not hold a lot of merit in this. Now, several months later in December 2005, the district attorney on this case, which was a man named John Healy, announced that they would be seeking the death penalty for Bart. Even though they were doing so for Bart, they would not be seeking the same for Chris, who was the one that actually murdered the Whitaker family. Law enforcement decided that Chris and Stephen were only going along with this and would not have committed such a violent crime without Bart's influence. Bart was the puppet master in this whole thing. So Stephen and Chris both got 15 years in prison. So let's talk about this trial. So before the trial even starts, Bart is being arraigned by the jury. And what this essentially means is before a trial, a defendant will walk out, the judge will explain the charge against them and then say, do you plead guilty or not guilty? And then whoever the defendant is will say, guilty or not guilty. However, when Bart walked out into the courtroom and was asked, do you plead guilty or not guilty for this? He didn't say anything. He didn't plead guilty and he didn't plead not guilty. He just refused to answer. And how a lot of people took that is that Bart was refusing to take responsibility for what he did. However, also wanted to take a little bit of credit for it as well. Because if he didn't want to take responsibility, he could have just said not guilty, but he didn't do that. He just simply refused to answer. And so because of that, the judge presumed it to be not guilty, which meant the trial would be moving forward. Now this trial began in March of 2007, which was four years after the murders. And the prosecution's argument was basically that Bart wanted his family dead for the insurance money he would receive. Now, Bart's defense in this was that his constant drug use as well as his mental health were the reasons and the contributing factors as to why he ended up doing this. Now, basically, everyone knew that Bart was responsible for this. That was not what was up for debate. What was up for debate was the charge that he was going to receive. Was it going to be a death penalty charge? Was it going to be life in prison? His charge was really what was up for debate here. And not as much, did you do this or did you not? Because everyone basically knew that Bart did this. Now, on the third day of the trial, Stephen Champagne was called to testify. And similar to what Cindy had said, Stephen detailed how Bart had told him that he was an orphan. And he would always tell Stephen that he was like the brother he never had. Stephen said in the late summer 2003 is when Bart started talking about wanting his family killed. And then in September 2003, is when Bart officially asked Stephen and Chris. But Stephen also gave a very interesting piece of information. He said that after the murders were completed, just two months after the murders had taken place, Bart had reached out to Chris and Stephen a second time, this time wanting to recruit them again to kill his father, Kent. Stephen said that the exact quote that Bart used was quote unquote, the job wasn't finished. Now Bart's trial lasted six days and the jury deliberated for two hours hours before returning with their verdict. The jury found Bart Whitaker to be guilty of capital murder. Now at the sentencing, Barg decided to take the stand and speak directly to the jury. In order for him not to receive the death penalty, he would have had to convince the jury that he's not a threat to anyone in or out of prison. When asked if he felt any remorse by the defense attorney for what he did, Bart said, quote, I feel remorse for everyone involved, starting with my dad, my mom, and my brother. Everyone I ever met in my life, I feel sorry for having come in contact with me, end quote. Now, when asked for the reasoning of why he did what he did, Bart said, quote, I have come up with a lot of reasons for how I got where I was going, but they do not explain it. I always felt that whatever love they sent me was conditional on a standard that I just never felt I could reach, end quote. And when Bart was asked if he would ever hurt another individual, Bart said, quote, no, the only people I've ever hated, and I know it wasn't for the right reasons, but the only people I have ever hated were my parents and my brother, end quote. So with that all being said, I want to talk about someone who's also very important in this case, and that is Bart's father, Kent. Now, Kent from the beginning was always defending Bart. He wasn't excusing what he did, and he wasn't saying that he didn't believe that Bart did it. However, he always went to bat for him and stated that he did not want Bart to receive the death penalty. Not only that, Kent said that Patricia and Kevin would also not want Bart to receive the death penalty. And while he says that he doesn't understand why Bart did what he did, he also forgives him. Now, Kent has 
really leaned in to his faith throughout this entire hell of a journey that he has been on. He's really leaned in to his faith to get him through it. And he really believes in forgiveness. And ironically enough, Kent and Bart really did bond through all of this, through all of the trials and through Kent visiting Bart in prison. They really got a lot closer, so much so that at his sentencing, Bart said that his dad had actually become one of his best friends, which is very interesting if you think about it, because just three years prior to that, Bart had been spending the last three years of his life trying to kill his entire family. So now that the defense had cross-examined Bart, it was the prosecution turn. Now, the prosecution's strategy here was to convince the jury that Bart's disconnect to reality is what makes him dangerous and capable of committing something like this again. Bart had claimed that he was a different person at that point than he was when the murders occurred. However, the prosecution told him that they don't believe that he was sorry for what he did. They believe that he was sorry that he got caught. Now, the court deliberated for 11 hours for this sentencing, and after 11 hours, they determined that Bart was going to be receiving the death penalty. Once this verdict was read, Kent said that he was extremely disappointed in the justice system. Kent said that he knew that him, Patricia, and Kevin would all be in heaven together, and that he wanted Bart to be there with them. Now, Bart's execution date was scheduled for February 22nd, 2018, at 6 p.m. In the week leading up to Bart's execution, Kent, his father, actually went to the Texas Boards of Pardons and Paroles to try and plead with them to get the death penalty conviction overturned. Kent said, quote, we're not asking to forgive him or let him go. We just want him to live. Bart was my last surviving member of my natural family and no one in my family wants to see him executed, end quote. Now, after hearing Kent's plea, the board then decided to turn the appeal over to the governor, who ultimately has the final decision. However, February 22nd arrived and there was no word. So the execution was moving forward. Now, Kent went to go see Bart for one last time and they said goodbye through the glass window. Bart also got his last meal and he was then preparing to be strapped to the gurney and executed through lethal injection. Now, just 40 minutes before his execution time, 40 minutes, there was a phone call. The phone call was from the governor, a man named Governor Abbott, and Governor Abbott informed the other person on the line that he was overturning the death penalty conviction. He said, quote, in just over three years as governor, I have allowed 30 executions. I have not granted a commutation of a death sentence until now. The murders of Mr. Whitaker's mother and brother are reprehensible. The crimes deserve severe punishment for the criminals who killed them. The recommendation of the text Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles, and my action on it ensures Mr. Whitaker will never be released from prison, end quote. So this is when Bart's sentence basically changed just like that. Only 40 minutes is what stood in between Bart and his death. However, because the governor stepped in, now he no longer was facing a death penalty sentence. Now he was just facing life in prison. Now, Kent was absolutely ecstatic. He said that he was jumping up and down. Everyone was so elated. And Bart did come out with a statement. He said, quote, I'm thankful for the decision, not for me, but for my dad, end quote. Now, over the years, Kent has gotten remarried and spends his time visiting Bart as well as talking about forgiveness. He wrote a book called Murder by Family and has said that he believes justice would, quote, be the opportunity to spend his life helping others and allowing me the opportunity to walk that road with them end quote. Now, Bart currently is serving his time at the McConnell Unit in Solitary Confinement located in Beeville, Texas, and that, you guys, is the case of the Whitaker family. I'm really interested to see what you guys think about Kent's whole stance on this because I kind of teetered with it back and forth for a while, but ultimately there's no way I could come to a decision of what I believe on it because luckily I have never been in this situation, so I don't know how that feels. And I think the decision that I've come to is that forgiveness is the only way that Kent's been able to cope through this. He's been able to cope through his grief by forgiving and forgiving his own son nonetheless. 
But like I said, I do want to hear what you guys have to say about it. So make sure you go ahead and leave that in the comments below. And that is all for me today, you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Killer Instinct. Again, if you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I am your host of Killer Instinct. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly here every Wednesday on the podcast and every Thursday on YouTube. I will be back next week with a brand new case for you guys. And until then, stay safe. Bye guys. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Make sure you tune in next week where we talk about the horrific and gruesome case of Hella Craft. This is one you are not going to want to miss and I can't wait to see you there.